We're continuing in a series entitled Transformed, and last week I was uh, teaching on spiritual health. What are the habits to be spiritually healthy? And this week we're going to be looking at physical health. Now, I want you to know I was uh, traveling with the staff last week. We were out in California um, in, a, in a scenario where we were being taught by by some friends of ours on discipleship and how to grow and stretch and, and some processes for the church. And it was really great. And every day, Bailey and Israel, uh, Israel's our children's pastor, they, they got up and they exercised and they went running and it was really nice. And Lori and Barb, they ate salads every day and they, you know, were really watching their health. And then there was Ben and I. And we ate really well. And walked around some. So I'm here to tell you, I am no expert on what I'm about to teach on, right? I want you to know, I am not here to make you feel awful. I'm just here to continue in the series, like you are. Good? <laughs> you know, it's, it's no secret what it takes to be in better health. Right? We all know that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you what you already know. We know that to be in better health, we need to eat less, move more. Stress less, sleep better, right? All those things, we sort of know it. We kind of already have the understanding of what it takes to get started and, and really the, the how to do it. Last week I said, information alone isn't transformational. It's not just enough to know that brings a transformation. It's knowing and doing that really leads to breakthrough, right? So it's not just enough to know what to do. We have to do it. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. So I don't want to spend a lot of time trying to convince us of what we already know, but I do want us to look at the motivation of why God says our bodies matter. I want to look at the motivation on why we should take care of our bodies and why our health does matter to God. If you don't remember anything else I say today, I hope you'll remember this. It's kind of the bottom line of everything uh, for today's teaching is my physical habits, my physical habits should help me accomplish God's purpose and calling for my life. My physical habits, what I can control. You know, there's a lot of things about my physical life that I can't control. Uh, there's a lot of things on shelves that I can't reach either, right? There's not a lot I can do about that. It's not like I can, I can will myself through some habit to grow any taller. I've been this height since like eighth grade. I've been waiting on the growth spurt. I've eaten like it was coming many times, right? All those things, but here I am. Um, there's a lot of things that are beyond my control, but when it comes to the habits that I can control, right, all of us have things within the realm of our control. When it comes to my physical habits that I can control and speak into, my physical habits should help me accomplish God's purpose and calling for my life. Because I believe God has a purpose for your life. He doesn't want you to miss it. He has a plan for your life. He wants you to live in it. And we need energy and stamina to do it, right? We need energy and stamina in order to accomplish it. Hey, I want to introduce you to a friend. Uh, several of you probably know him. His name's Isaac. Isaac, if you wouldn't mind to join me uh, real quick. Everybody say, hi, Isaac. Hi, Isaac. Isaac's living proof that Melissa I never should have given away all the skinny ties like 20 years ago. I gave away a closet full, but they're back. Isaac's super trendy. Um, sorry for that. Hey, show us this picture on this slide. We have a before and after picture of Isaac that I want you to see. And that's about a year ago, right? On the, the before pictures about a year ago. And then you see Isaac today. Isaac, talk to us a little bit about why and how you started in this physical transformation process of your life. Um, about the same time as that picture was taken, my cousin asked me, will you do a Spartan race with me? And he had done a couple, and I knew... So that's like one of these tough mutter runs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I knew that if I didn't get in shape for it, it was going to be a nightmare. Like right. two hours of pain. So I started to get in shape for it, and about halfway through, the, like the process was the Spartan race, and then after that I got into running and stuff like that, and just changing my eating habits. Yeah, so at what point did you feel like quitting before you you reached your goal. Well, two months in, I remember thinking there's like no changes. I don't notice anything. 
So and you sort of hit a plateau? It, well, I didn't hit a plateau. It just didn't, it didn't feel like there was a change. I knew there were changes happening. Okay. But I didn't notice anything, and I was like, I can still back out of the race, and no one would really, really care too much if I didn't do it. But Right. So you, you, in the first service, I said, well, so when did it happen? He said, well, I hadn't paid for the race yet. <laughs> now I know why people pay way in advance, yeah. right? So about two months in, you felt like quitting. Mm-hmm. So what was it that helped you push through? I think it was, um, I'd seen some stuff online, like people's after stuff, and I was like, I know it's possible. Like, I, I knew it was possible, and I had to keep telling myself it's possible, but mentally saying I'm going to start, because I remember a lot of times I could just not go. I didn't tell people I was going to, like, the gym or doing stuff. I could just not go, and no one would know a difference. But telling myself I'm going to get out for myself, like, it's not for anyone else. It's just for me to get healthier, basically. Right, yeah. So what, what are some of the changes other than, you know, obviously we see changes, but what are some of the benefits that you're now living in? Um, I sleep way better. I think I just, it's more relaxing. Um, I, I think I just feel like more energy throughout the day. I'm not, exa- I'm not just tired anymore. Like I, I'm tired at night, you know, when I'm ready to go to sleep, but um, I just notice a lot of changes like that. I don't, I'm not as dependent on certain things, and my whole outlook of food has changed like what goes in I have control of it I remember thinking why don't I have control of what goes in like it's my body it's like I should decide what goes in my body gotcha very cool well congratulations man it uh, obviously is a byproduct of a lot of effort and hard work appreciate you man we have somebody else that will share a part of their story here in just a little bit um you know, the reasons to get healthy and stay healthy aren't just so we, that we can look good or, or receive compliments. The implications are a lot more than that. The implications of health um, really are eternal. That's what the Bible tells us. You know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty easy to buy the lie that, that God only cares about my heart and my mind. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that God cares about us about all of us, and our body is a part of us, and the implications are, are pretty big. And God cares about our bodies, not only because we live in our bodies, but because the Bible tells us He lives in our bodies. Did you know the Bible says that? That, that the Holy Spirit lives in our bodies, so God cares about our bodies? He, he really is concerned and interested in what we do with our bodies. Um, And you know, here's another truth. Anything God's going to do through your life, he's going to do through your body. Did you know that? If he's going to speak words of encouragement to somebody uh, through you, he's going to use your body to do it. He's going to use your mouth. Or if you type an encouragement or send a text of encouragement, he's going to use your body to do it. If he's going to use your hands to serve somebody, right? Last week I said we look most like Jesus when we're serving. Jesus said, I didn't come to to be served, I came to serve. And and the greatest among you will be the servant of all. In order to serve, he uses our bodies most of the time. He uses our ears to hear hurting people. He uses our bodies to work through for his purposes. So our bodies matter. And, And that's why we need to steward our energy, we need to have enough energy and stamina to do what God's purpose and calling are in our lives. That's, people say all the time, well, what kind of shape should I be in? I think you need to be in, enough, in good enough shape to fulfill God's purpose for your life, that you can live out His purpose, right? I, I think our culture sells a really, um, a really toxic image of how we should look. God just wants us to be healthy. He wants us to be healthy. He says, beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news, Paul says in Romans. Your feet are beautiful when, they're, when, when you have enough energy and stamina to carry the good news of Jesus. Anything God's going to do through our lives, he uses our body. So my physical habits should help me accomplish God's purpose and calling for my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there's a, it's kind of the classic passage that Paul uses um, to talk about our bodies, and it talks about a lot of immorality and, and different things, but 
but what we do with our bodies matters. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, everything is permissible for me, but not everything's beneficial. Everything's permissible, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? That's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. He goes on in verse 18, Flee from sexual immorality, all other sins. A man commits or outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple? Would you say the word temple? Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. There are four key truths that I want to look at when it comes to our physical health Four key biblical truths that I want us to take a look at today. And the first is this. God's property includes my body. God's property includes my body. And, you know, it's a foreign idea for most of us when we think about it. But the Bible tells us that that God owns our body. Right? We live in this this world that says, well, my body's my own. I can do anything with my body that I want to do. Well, Paul addresses that. He's like, yeah, you're, you're allowed, but it's not really good for you. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. God's property includes my body. So your body's not your own. This is, what, this is what David said in Psalm 139. You made my whole being. You formed me in my mother's body. I praise you because you made me in an amazing and wonderful way. What you've done is wonderful. I know this very well. Paul said in in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? God's property includes my body. It includes me. And when we begin to see God's property, including my body, I think it's easier to understand the need to honor him with our bodies. It's easier to, to, to make the, the leap in our mind that we, we should honor God with our, our very being. It's not just in, in our mind, it's, it's in our body. It's in our body. See, God owns everything and he loans it to us. This body is on loan, right? God owns it, he made it, he loans it, right? Everything we have in this life is on loan. The talent, the talent that we have, it's on loan, right? The, the, the money that we have, God owns it, he loans it, right? That's just the way it works. Everything we see, God created. Everything we see one day won't be here. He made it and it returns to him, but it's his and he loans it to us. God owns our bodies. If we're believers, the Bible teaches us that our bodies aren't our own, they're on loan. So we should realize, have you ever loaned your vehicle to somebody that that you're like, man, I hope they care for my car better than they care for their own. Anybody? Right? We, we want to care for people's stuff, right? When somebody loans you something, you always want to give it better, back to them better than you found it, right? Our bodies are on loan. The second thing, the second key biblical truth is this. My body was bought at a high price. You and I are valuable real estate to God. You and I are valuable real estate to God. God loves us so much that Jesus said, I I love you so much, I'm going to sacrifice my physical body so that you can live with me forever in eternity. I'm going to give my body as a sacrifice once and for all, fulfilling. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. I'm going to fulfill the law code of the Old Testament by being the last blood sacrifice, dying on the cross, in our place, so that we can spend eternity with God. That's pretty powerful. Verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 6, you're not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
Paul says, therefore, whenever you get to the word therefore in the Bible, you have to go back and look at what it's referring to. And Paul starts in, in chapter 1, and he works his way all through the letter till we get to the, to the end of the what we call the 11th chapter of Romans. And he starts in chapter, chapter 1 of verse 12, and he says, therefore, in view, having, having understood all these things that he's already talked about, therefore, in view of God's mercy... Therefore, in view of God's mercy, mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. It's interesting, he doesn't say, therefore offer your minds, therefore offer, offer your, your thoughts. Uh, I think all those are included when we get to verse 2 of, of the 12th chapter of Romans. Therefore offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. Verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, what happens between your ears, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. God cares about our bodies. The way I care about my body is an act of worship. Have you ever thought about it like that? The way we care about our body is an act of worship. So I want to honor God with my body, and, and I, want, I want God to know that I appreciate my follically inha- impaired body. I want to honor God with my body. I want to take care of what he's given me. The third biblical truth uh, to, to realize is this. Managing my body is God's expectation. How we manage our bodies matters to God. Managing my body is God's expectation. Chapter 6, verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Paul says, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. You know, um, we're at a different stage of parenting, and we're we're kind of at that coaching transitional stage, right? Our, our kids are growing older and they're growing, they're growing up and they'll be growing out of our house at some point in the, in the viewfinder a little more quickly now. And it's really interesting how, how we begin to have these conversations and frame conversations in this context as you have teenagers that are wanting to be independent and you're coaching them, yeah, you, you can stay up until one in the morning, you can, but you shouldn't, right? You, you have to get up at 6.30 tomorrow morning. It probably would be good for you not to stay up that late, right? You, you start realizing just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Just because you're technically allowed doesn't mean it's technically smart, right? We do a lot of things that we're technically allowed to do that are technically stupid, right? And Paul's going, look, Manage your body. God has an expectation that you manage your body and that you take care of that which has been given to you. So managing our our physical health is a spiritual discipline. So we need to have physical habits that are linked to our spiritual disciplines. Right? I'm not saying we all need to be zealots and and we need to, to start buying beauty products and be vain and all that jazz, I'm saying that we need to care about what God's given us. We need to be wise stewards, wise managers of what God has given us. The fourth key truth is this. My body's where the Holy Spirit lives. My body's where the Holy Spirit lives. God has always had an earthly dwelling place on earth ever since the time of Exodus. God gave Moses the dimensions for the tabernacle. Do you remember? The cloud was 
was traveling over them, showing them where to go, and, and the cloud would stay in some areas for up to a year and other areas up to a day. And every time the cloud moved, they would pack up the tabernacle. It was the tent of meeting, right? The tent that God came and, and met with, with Moses and Aaron, and they would meet with God there, and they would go out and tell the Israelites what God had said. So in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, you can read about the tabernacle. You fast forward, you get to David, and God began to give David the dimensions for the temple. God, David really wanted to build a temple to God, and, and God said, David, you're not the one to build it, but here's, here's what you should start gathering. This will be the layout. And Solomon built a temple that replaced the tabernacle, and Jesus says, we're now the temples of the Holy Spirit that replaced the physical temple. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away so the Holy Spirit can come. We're two-legged temples. Jesus was really excited to leave because he knew when the Holy Spirit came and lived in us, we would carry the message exponentially to hurting people all over the world about who he is and the hope that he gives. We're the temple. Our bodies are the dwelling place. Our body is where the Holy Spirit lives and resides is in us. And that's important when we think about what does it mean to care for my body 6.19 6.19 says, Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? Chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, Don't you know you're God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Have you heard people say, I don't put that in my temple? Even non-Christians, this is where it comes from. It's the Bible that says we're the temple. The Bible is where they get it. Even if they don't believe in Jesus, that's the origination place of where temple talk about our body comes from. Our bodies are the temple. You know, one of the churches I love, uh, I I like old church architecture. We're building new church, and it won't look anything like old church architecture, but I always enjoy looking at old church architecture. One of the things that makes me really sad are how empty old churches are, right? Right? Um, but if we were walking down the street in, in Old Hilliard, and you guys know the historic church that sits on the corner in Old Hilliard? If we were walking down the street and we saw somebody with a spray can shaking it, getting ready to, to desecrate the, the church, or, or they have a, a ball bat and they're walking up to a window, we, we, would, we would yell, right? We would, somebody would call the police and Others of us would try to get them to quit doing that because something in us would say, that is not right. You don't desecrate a holy place. You don't vandalize a holy place, right? We would, we would, we would have this natural step into it moment, right? I remember a few Christmas Eves ago, I think it was 2013, uh, I got in a call in the early, early morning hours of Christmas Eve, like 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was the alarm company, and they said some the alarm's going off. By the time I got here, there were squad cars. The front, the front doors had been smashed out. Uh, the Christmas tree and all the ornaments were scattered everywhere. TVs were ripped off the walls. I was angry. I was angry, not because stuff can't be replaced. Stuff's easy to replace, right? I was angry because there was such a disrespect for a place that I hold dear because God works among the people in this place. We gather corporately to, to, make, to make much of the Father, and that, that just bothered me deep in my, in my gut, right? So I think it would be easy for us to realize that we would never think it's okay to vandalize a holy place, but I think sometimes it's easy for us to vandalize holy places right? If my diet is consistently made up of junk food, that might look like vandalism. If my habits are leading to a drastic decline in my health, that might look like vandalism. If I give myself a pass on on having discipline in my eating habits, Maybe we, we get to that line, right? I get that I'm not the picture of fitness. And I'm not saying that we all need to go buy a membership to the gym. What I am saying is God has planned good works for us to do. 
and we need energy and stamina to do it. And if we're living over our head in stress and we're embracing habits that take from us instead of giving to us energy and stamina, then we're not really being the sacrifice in our bodies that that we're called to be, right? The hard thing about being a living sacrifice, as Romans 12 says, is living sacrifices can crawl off the altar. We're to live out our worship. We're to live it out. So here are the four key areas. We'll just look at them again in review. My body's God's property. My body has a, has a high price tag. It was bought at a high price. Managing my body is God's expectation. Managing my body is God's expectation. And my body is where the Holy Spirit lives. The dwelling place of the Holy Spirit is in us. You know, we're building a building, and I'm really excited. The steel is being, the rest of it will be delivered tomorrow for the steel structure, and you'll start seeing beams and things uh, on the site standing up, and that's exciting. But we're building a building. We're building a tool because we're the temple. We are the temple, the right of the Holy Spirit, you and I. I want to introduce you to Kim. Many of you know Kim. Everybody say, hi, Kim. Kim's going to share a little bit. Kim and Dave have been coming here for four years now? About four years. About four years. And you see the before and after picture uh, there of, of Kim's journey and process. And tell us a little bit about when that started for you and why. Um, For me, it started in the fall of 2013. Our son, Andrew, came home with an application, and he wanted to go with the teens to Guatemala. And, of course, we were excited and wanted him to go and got to thinking, you know, what if God called me to go? I am physically not able to go. I cannot walk up my own steps carrying my groceries and not be winded. What What if my neighbor needs help with theirs? I can't help my neighbor. How can I even think about going to Guatemala? So I knew then, you know, I need to start making some changes. And fortunately for me, it was a time when LifePoint that November decided we were going to do a fast. And we could fast on different things that we needed to change in our life. So I chose to do the Daniel fast for 21 days, removed a lot of things from my diet, and realized that I felt a lot better. And I was letting God be in control of what was going into my body that month. And he did a much better job than I was doing. (laughs) I was feeling it was some pretty bad things, and I was sitting on the couch. And now I'm happy to say that I own a bicycle. My family and I were able this summer to go on a 20-mile bike ride together and enjoy it. I've been to Guatemala twice. I'm going again the end of this month and again in March, and I'm excited about that. And I no longer take cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, and I'm 60 pounds lighter doing it all. Yeah, isn't that great? (laughs) It's really great. And it's, and it's been a journey, right? It's, it's been a, a journey. journey. It's, it's not easy. And to know that you need to let him be in control and to know that, you know, you need to do it for him and that he's got a plan for you is awesome. And to know that his plan is going to bring great things to your life and to others. And it's been a blessing to do all these great trips. Yeah. And so you just took control over really what you were able to take control over, right? Yep. And, and you've seen the reward. Yeah, so if somebody's here today and is, is going, I, I know I need to start, what would you say to them? Um, I would say pray. Pray. Pray um, and look to him and let him lead you on how you're going to make those changes because he has a plan and he has a way and he will help you every step. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kim. That's so good. Appreciate you. That's so good. You know, when uh, we go to Guatemala, the last time we were there, if you've ever been to Central America, you know that if you show up with a soccer ball, you're the most popular person in a village, right? I mean, it just happens that way. And, uh, and we're looking for Kim, and I'm like, where, where, well, where'd she go? She didn't come in from playing. She's really good at soccer now. <laughs> so as soon as we show up in the village, they're like, soccer, soccer, football, football, right? They just want to play. It's fun to watch Kim go and school all these little kids that are barefoot, and she pushes them down. I mean, but she's out there all day. That's the point. <laughs> no, we have a great time, but it's really cool to see what God's done in and through her life, right? Because now she has the energy. 
she has the energy and the confidence to be able to lean in to what God was calling her to do because she took authority over what she could, right? When it comes to our physical habits, here's the takeaway. We can all take authority over the areas of life that we can speak into. Some of us have physical abnormalities. We know that. Some of us have different things going on that we can't just will to change right away. But if we're doing things in our habits that take away from honoring God or giving us energy to serve Him with, we should take authority over those areas, right? And every journey starts with the first step. Every journey starts with the first step. So if you have a habit that is unhealthy, I'm just encouraging you to pray and give that habit to God and ask Him to begin to change the way you think about it and the way you act on it. Amen? So this week, I'm going to ask you to commit this verse to memory, Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your spiritual act of worship. Father, would you be with us in these moments, and would you move in us in moments like this? Lord, I know that, that sermons on and teachings on physical health are sometimes hard to receive, and they're even hard to give, but I pray that your spirit would be at work in us, and that we would honor you with our bodies, with what we do, what we eat, the, the places we go. Would we help us to honor you with our bodies? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.